Um, we just wanted to welcome you to the uh, Prisoner's Justice Film Festival, first one in London. I think most of you have been here already. Uh, I just want to acknowledge uh, that we are on, the festival takes place on the lands of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabek, the Huron, Wanda, and the Attawandaran people. Uh, and we have a great panel tonight speaking about resisting the prison industrial complex from reform to abolition. Uh, we have, uh, I'm not going to read each of their bios again because I think we've read them several times over the weekend in different occasions. I will let them introduce themselves. But we have um, Humberto, Awasis, yeah. Trini, or Ali, and Cyrus Ware who will be speaking. So, welcome. Thank you. Okay. Is there any order after that? Oh, do I really have to use the mic? You do because it's being recorded. Oh, great. <laughs> I was just kidding. So, I'm Ani Tanse. Sigehito Nawatas, Dishnikasham, of Mile Pe Gosken, Tapnaska de Omegon Saga, Tape Mizawag, Ale Clan Carre de la Riviere, de la Londe. So, um, my name is Oasis. My English name is Courtney. Um, I'm Painted Feather Woodland Métis, the, um, traditionally known as the people that own themselves, and um, the Kerai clan. I'm really happy to be here today. The festival has been really amazing. So miigwech. Thank you all for coming. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll just tell you a bit about what I do to start. And like jump in any time. I really want this to be participatory. So be like, I don't know what you said. And I'll try to answer you, or maybe someone else will. Um, so yeah, I work for Atlos, which is a Native Family Healing Service. Um, it comes from the Oneida word for friendship. It's just downtown. Um, so I do work there, as well as at Jawanong, which means uh, the southern direction. It's a Native Women and Children's Shelter. And um, the southern direction in um, Anishinaabe Mwen, the Ojibwe language, it really um, is associated a lot with um, rejuvenation, um, transformation, really like fill it, refilling your spirit up. You think warm wind, right? So um, part of what we do there is we, shel we have contracts with Corrections Canada to shelter women, um, Native women, who are serving time. So instead of spending time in jail, they can have the option of um, staying at the shelter, um, which is good for a number of reasons. It gives um, that access to culturally relevant like, healing circles and programs that the, they otherwise might be stigmatized um, in jail for for accessing. Um, there's I don't personally uh, visit jails, but there's people I work with that um, go to the L London Middlesex Detention Center quite a bit, and the amount that I hear about them going into smudge and with them with the inmates and um, just being like the guards being told by the guards like oh like made fun of for the program so the men's program is called Kije um, Anishinaabeen which means I'm a kind man and the guards will actually say things like oh like you're going to be a kind man today like like just ridicule them for that and um, yeah I'm just rambling trying to give you a picture of what's going on here so um, what things that we would like to work towards and because we really only have um, the capacity to house like a, wo a woman or two at a time in this the corrections program and um, um, things that I'd like to see happen is actually developing a sentencing circle. Um, so the uh, Cree word for what you would kind of translate as justice is kwayasko uh, tizuin, which is there were like when we think of justice we think we have all these like. Um, like a lot of legal processes in mind, right? A lot of the time, like you're you're innocent until proven guilty, and like this kind of thing. But that, like, none of that uh, existed within within the Cree understanding before colonization, right? So what kaiaskwatism means is more about um, like a balance, a, a even-handed fairness, like that's the traditional understanding of justice, right? So it's the idea that when, so for instance, that sentencing circle, if you're sitting down as um, someone who's being charged with something, you're, uh, you're not above or below anyone else in the circle. So that includes people that have been affected by your actions, their family, your family. Um, in the case of uh, colonial Canada, you'd, it would also be, you know, a judge from their system. But, um, I like it. 
I would like to think that this is a, st um, a step forward that actually encourages individual accountability by connecting us to one another as opposed to um, having to answer to a body that is asserting itself, uh, its authority over, over you, right? A, a, foreign, a foreign way of thinking and being. So yeah, um, what else do I want to say? I've never been in prison yet, <laughs> um, uh, but I have um, experienced, as I'm sure, if not everyone in this room, most of you, um, violence from that system. So, uh, I have. <laughs> yeah, no doubt, like it happens. I have from 1981. It's an inherently they violent system. So um, my uh, f the first time I was actually detained was last May at the National Energy Board hearing um, for Line 9. So if people don't know, there's a pipeline that runs just uh, north of Fanshawe Lake here. <coughs> yeah, so they're trying to reverse the flow to um, allow for a further tar sands expansion and um, continued, well, industrial genocide in on Danang First Nations, Chemical Valley, outside Sarnia. Um, they've been really at the forefront of, of the struggle for, for years and years now. So anyways, energy board hearing. So they ignore a whole bunch of letters from the surrounding First Nations and we go to remind them that their process is very undemocratic and illegitimate. It was fast-tracked twice and they're ignoring the concerns of First Nations who they're legally obligated to consult about this project on their land, right? So, um, I, w I w smallest kettle in the world, I think it was like six people surrounded me, and um, really no one would answer me right away. Like the first thing you're asking, right, is like, like can I leave? Am I free to leave? I want to go. And um, I, f I found that um, that was the tactic they were using. It was like, I, we're not going to give you very much information about what's actually happening. Maybe they, I don't think they had it, to be honest. They were waiting for, for someone else to tell them what to do. But um, I also, the next thing that, that sh struck me was um, how quick they were to um, accuse, accuse, well, make a lot of assumptions about my background. So it came up that I do have status, and right away they were like, oh, you're from Six Nations, you came in with all those folks. And I was like, yeah, I came in with them, but like, I'm not Haudenosaunee at all. Like, you know, like, so there, there was a lot of that accusing, I wasn't giving them the right name. So this is all, this is all part of that violence, I think, right? And, um... Yeah, so basically I'm concerned a lot about uh, the criminalization of descent, specifically of land defenders. Um, I consider myself a land defender and um, I just think that it's really no coincidence that Bill C-45, all the cuts to, to Aboriginal health, uh, refugee health, um, the different social services and all the, the cuts to the protection of our rivers and, and waters. I don't think it's a coincidence that this is occurring alongside massive prison expansion, right? You know that when you're, when you're infringing on people's right to health, healthy water, healthy air, and, um, and their right to social services, there's going to be increased crime, and they're anticipating this. So just wanted to draw that connection. I'm really looking forward to all your questions. Um, does someone else want to go next, Roberto? <laughs> um, well, I, I was surprised that I finally was the person from La Casa to, to be sitting here. So, um, but uh, this is, I guess, what we decided or something decided. Uh, I just want to kind of share with you our, our reflection uh, on this, and it's uh, to give you uh, a little bit of the information on our background on how we get here and what we thought about Canada when we came to Canada. Um, we came, uh, we are survivors of the uh, Patriotic Union in Colombia that was a political movement uh, created in the context of the peace accords of in 1984 between the farc -P and uh, and the Colombian government. 
Uh, and by the way, this, those peace accords in 1984 have had the same agenda as the 91-92 in Mexico, in Tlaxcala, in, and in Caracas, and the same agenda was put together in 1998 to 2000 uh, with uh, uh, the peace process with uh, the President Andes, Andres Pastrana, and is this today in Cuba, it's the same agenda. So, is no, uh, and, and the, 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 this process having advanced, it's not just because it's lack of political will from the people of Colombia, from ordinary people that the only thing they need is to raise their kids with dignity and provide housing for, for them and their kids. You know? So, uh, we as Colombian citizens, as part of the social movement, but, but because we stress that uh, in exile, we are Colombians and we are part of the Colombian uh, uh, social movement. So I just want to try to make uh, and improvise a little bit on a parallel of uh, what uh, that means, why we came you know, between being in Colombia and being in Canada, and uh, I hope that this sharing exercise reflect a little bit what is happening across Latin America and many other places in the world. So uh, we were working with the Patriotic Union, and at some point we left. Uh, we came uh, to Canada in 1998 as political refugees. And uh, it was kind of a choice to say <coughs> Canada, but we didn't know anything about Canada, but uh, but I would say, well, this looks like good, you know. Canada is kind of a, a liberal uh, country, you know, with social human <coughs> rights are respected and followed, and, you know. But uh, as soon as we arrive in Canada, you know, we interact with our their friends and comrades, uh, you know, from the Guatemalans and uh, from uh, our friends from El Salvador, Mexico, and fellow Canadians, and uh, we very soon after we arrived, we realized that uh, this was nothing else than the same kind of status quo that uh, we were fighting for in Colombia. So uh, we have been involved, Pilar, my partner, and I, as um, we share the space at La Casa. We all do at La Casa different things and uh, with our lives uh, politically, but uh, my focus has been I was the spokesperson for Fenso Agro from 2004-2008. Uh, Fenso Agro is the largest peasant uh, organization, uh, 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 class conscious of organization in Colombia. It's like the homologous would be like the National Farmers Union in Canada, but uh, with the difference that the National Farmers Union is not <laughs> surviving in the middle of an armed conflict and has just 2,000 members. But uh, Fenso Agro has 80,000 members. Over 1,000 has been murdered by the Colombian establishment, um, by the United States, and uh, more than 1,500 are in prison uh, up to these days. In 2008, uh, the high commander of FARC, EP, Raul Reyes, was uh, working, you know, was the spokesperson for FARC, and uh, they were very focused on concretizing a peace process during the Uribe Vélez regime, a very fascist and right-wing uh, government. So Raúl Reyes, you know, uh, the United States used the military base in Manta, Ecuador, to bomb him, uh, killing more than 30 people, uh, including uh, Raúl. Uh, Reyes. So uh, we just saw in the video or <coughs> that uh, some of the st uh, statements from political prisoners. Everybody was there in those, uh, they r rescued or recuperated some alleged co computers with some files with half of Colombia was in there, right? Because if you go to the rural areas of Colombia, the question is not like here, that FARC is here and the social movement is here and the activists are there, you know, uh, you know. No, it's all intertwined. Yay! It's all intertwined Good, and interconnected, right? Good, this, a, a problem that I have digesting the film, 
from our fellow Congress in prison is that uh, they say, well, I was, I, I'm here all screw up because they accused me to, for being FARC. The problem is, you no, know, you are FARC and you are FARC, or you are a social activist, you work here and there or doing this and that. The problem is, you know, what your political views are and, and how they need, you know, this is an old slogan <laughs> from the Marxism, right? But it's not the apparatus, it's not just ideological, you know, it's also repression and, you know, suppression of, of uh, ideas to perpetuate the ideology and the status quo. So in 2008, so, uh, some of our comrades, like Liliani, as I told you, has been here three times in Canada, was detained and uh, went to prison with two charges, one being accused for belong to FARC and the other one to divert uh, the <laughs> money for FARC from uh, Canadian unions and Australian unions. And, uh, so, and uh, people like Miguel Angel, in Mexico was an academic. Mexico just took him, cut him, and handed over to Colombia and put in prison. Some other people, like our friends in Australia or we here, we just have a visit from Jesus and that was it, right? But uh, we don't know. We are very serious, seriously concerned about these issues. Why? Because when you commit here and you engage yourself for social justice and change, for human rights and openness, democratization of the political structures, how you became a political risk, you know, an enemy and a very high, um, I don't have the word, uh, 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 you, I mean, when you stand, the point I want to make is, for example, see what happened with mining. These guys, you know, go, uh, the Canadian uh, mining company, go all around the world saying that they are representing Canadian interests, they are following the law, and they are helping people there extracting this material as a process, a legal process, you know, and all the revenue comes to Canada for the Commonwealth in Canada. I mean, for, for, for the redistribute, you know, is Canadian interest, right? But uh, what happened, you know? When you stand against mining comp corporations, you know, you are becoming really, as we talked uh, one time, a problem of national security. So with this Mr. Kenny, the deportation minister and all that thing, they can even take away your citizenship. You know, they have very clear that we have here two kind of refugees. One are good refugees, and the other one are bad refugees. So, and then you stand here and stand up for indigenous rights, for human rights in general, against privatization. You know, against mining. You know, to go. You know, see that it's our money is lobbying the Congress in El Salvador and in Colombia and to change the mining laws. So if you stand up as citizen for that, no? or w if we stand you know, to say the ambassador of Colombia, like what happened with Jorge Vizval Martelo, the president of the Carol Ranchers Association that are linked to all the murders in Colombia, expropriated from peasants six million hectares that today are in hands of paramilitaries and mafia, mafiosos, you know, an elite producing bio, bio, biofuels and things like that. So you stand here in Ottawa and say, I, as a Colombian, this guy doesn't represent me. You say a drug trafficker is a, an assassin and doesn't represent me. So when you stand for your rights, and even the simple fact that your right is to stand up and to think what you believe, to say what you think that you should say. We thought that Canada was the place for this academical exercise where good and bad comes together or whatever, good and bad, really, you know? And this is, you know, we are all good. No, we are not all good. Because now we can be targeted. Bad refugees can be deported, right? 
We have an open fine with the RCMP because we come and say these things. Why? So this is the Canada uh, that we were very deceived, very disappointed, is the word, man, with the Canada we found. So as La Casa, La Casa and the INSPP, the International Net Network in Support to Colombian Political Prisoners, thank you guys for the opportunity of being here, you know, to try to connect in this way. Because as we say, why Colombia? <laughs> why nobody talks about Colombia, right? Colombia is an important matter in this imperialistic uh, agenda, right? So, and uh, through Colombia is where they want to bomb Chavez and everywhere. The military bases in Colombia managed and handled by North American personnel. We're used to, they, they, they are meant to, uh, uh, the purpose is to refuel the, 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 the airplanes to go with no direct to Afghanistan or Iraq or anywhere else what they need. So we at La Casa and the NSPP salute the peace talks because it's not a peace process because there is no will from the government. They don't want to do agrarian reform. They don't want to do a peace process with no humanitarian accords. People in jail, no truce. But anyway, we at La Casa and the NSP salute the peace talks, hoping that they can evolve into a peace process for the, to put an end and for the final negotiated political solution to the final, to the to the Colombian conflict. We at La Casa and the NSPP stand here in solidarity and war for all political prisoners around the world. Political prisoners of conscience and political prisoners of war. Because it's not our, our war. Now we say, oh, that guy, you know, is what kind of, I don't, with the testimonies, because there are some political prisoners of conscience that because Imagine you as a teacher, you know, going to class and trying to build ethics, trying to make the kids start the thinking process of having principles. And then you are arrested because, because you are a threat for the status quo. So we at La Casa and the NSPP salute the, resi the resistance in so many ways salute all these efforts, and we are in solidarity. We are becoming old, and we just want to gather and eat cookies and things. But uh, we will be always there. Right? So uh, I just, I, I don't know if I have answers for the panel, because it's, it's why we put this film beyond the walls. As we say, Colombia, a case study. Uh, so we... <laughs> We, we, uh, it's very specific, but uh, that doesn't mean that it's not interconnected. We are human rights and people from FARC, we don't believe in that anti terrorist bullshit because you working against mining now you are a terrorist because you are against the Canadian interest. Sorry. <laughs> No, no, was it? That's it. Yeah, sorry. No. So, 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 so we don't believe in that shit, and we are always here, present in solidarity with all of, uh, people that have been excluded from this inequality. So, I, I will leave there. Yeah. <coughs> We just have the rock, paper, scissors, and I'm next, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my name is Trini, and I'm actually I was looking around at my other panel members, and it's really awesome that this is one of the most diverse panels I've ever been on. And so I'm kind of excited <laughs> about that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that says, but <laughs> I'm excited. Um, 
I am here uh, from No One Is Legal London, and so our interest in this is related to the detention of immigrants and refugees coming into the country. And recent legislation that has gone through has significantly increased the number of detainees coming in, as well as has granted um, some pretty broad sweeping powers to the Minister of Sense. Uh, not censorship, um, citizenship <laughs> is the correct title, <laughs> um, which are really scary. Um, for example, immigrants can be designated as coming in as what they're calling irregular arrivals, and this uh, category is really broad even by the definition of um, the ministry. And so pretty much um, Jason Kenney and uh, Vic Toes we have the power to co-sign an agreement saying that this particular group of immigrants, they're considered regular because we can't figure out who they are and why they're coming here. Um, and so until we figure that out, they get thrown into a jail. Um, also, if a group of immigrants do come in and they suspect that they're coming in as part of a smuggling ring, it's the same thing. They can be categorized as irregular arrivals and thrown straight into detention centers. Uh, Canada right now has about three immigrant holding centers. It used to be four. The Kingston Detention Center has been closed down recently. It was known as Guantanamo Bay North, which should mm. tell you a lot. Um, and the other thing about the Kingston Center was that it was a place that those arrested on security certificates would be held. Um, four to five of those on security certificates right now were held there. Uh, no One Is Legal in Toronto has been working very closely with the case of Mohamed Majoub, who uh, just last week got his uh, monitoring bracelet cut off. So we're pretty excited about that. Uh, the Federal Court of Appeals has finally said that uh, the measures that CSIS and the Canadian Border Services have been using against him were considered cruel and unjustified. They didn't have enough evidence to put him under things as uh, he had a monitoring bracelet. He couldn't go anywhere without his um, his guarantor. He had no access to internet. He had no access to computers, to cell phones. If he had a medical emergency, he was not allowed to call. Someone else had to call. Um, anywhere he traveled had to be filed with Canadian Border Services a month in advance. We brought him into London uh, last year, and the paperwork involved was mind-blowing. Um, I think I had to memorize like seven pages of rules. <laughs> um, and so he couldn't go underground because that could cut off signal to his tracker. And so all of his freedom was completely taken away from him, um, basically because they suspected him of uh, terrorism, and they achieved information from him through methods of torture. And hearing his story, I was horrified. As an immigrant coming to this country, I know we chose, like uh, Humberto talked about, why did you choose Canada? And my family chose Canada because um, Canada wasn't involved in the Gulf War at the time, and it was seen as this really liberal, safe, open place. And then I hear the story about uh, this immigrant who's simply taken off the streets and thrown into a holding cell and then tortured by Canadian authorities, and it, well, I'm kind of scared to travel now. <laughs> Um, but so, these matters that have been coming through with the government, um, they're called that they're protecting Canada's Immigration and Refugee Act. Um, and the question is, who are they really protecting? And so, it, they've been stirring up a lot of anti-immigrant and anti-refugee sentiment. And as Humberto mentioned, there is this whole case of who is considered the right type of refugee, who's considered the right type of immigrant. And these are very um, privileged questions that they're asking. And one of the other reasons for this that the Conservative government is really spreading is uh, a matter of saving money and being conscious of how much money is being spent on these services. And um, about $239 is spent per day by the Canadian government in terms of immigration detention. And so when you compare this to the cost of social housing, which is less than $31 a day, it makes you wonder, like, what is the real target of this? And, uh, you know, that's costing in terms of immigration detention doesn't even cover how much money is spent on um, security certificate detainees, those who are being surveilled outside. Um, and, you know, those who are involved in activism who are not Canadian citizens, who are permanent residents, who are here on visas, they 
can have these taken away at any time the government deems that they are a risk to national security. And this, again, is another really broad term. So if you are an immigrant to this country and you do not have citizenship in this country as yet, which is a lengthy process, and it's also a privileged process because of all the fees you have to pay um, and all the health um, tests as well that you have to undergo, um, you can quite easily lose your status in this country and be returned to the country that you are escaping persecution from or that you cannot return to. There have been several cases in the past year in which Canada has been deporting immigrants to countries which they never came from. So they're deporting second and third generation immigrants um, who were born here to immigrant families and then sending them back to where they have no roots. And that's... Um, a really concerning case because these cases are usually coming from very um, living below the poverty line immigrants, um, especially in northern Canada, especially within the Somali uh, communities as well. They're seen as very troubled communities, and so they're just being deported back as a stopgap, it seems like. The other thing is that they started doing a designated safe country list, which has 27 countries on it right now. Um, and countries can be added or taken away um, based on how Kenny slept that night, basically. Um, if he wants to take them off, he can. And if he wants to put something on, he can. Um, and what this has done, especially in terms of Roma refugees coming across to Canada, is that they're not on the safe. Hungary is seen as one of the countries on the safe list. And so it's not recognizing their persecution at all. And so... December the 12th of last year, um, Kenny instituted his first act of irregular arrivals by uh, throwing 85 Roma refugees into a detention center when they came in. And so this increasing detention and criminalization of refugees and immigrants is really concerning um, to folks who are trying to flee the same thing happening in their country and then coming here. And the other thing in terms of I'm part of the queer community and you have immigrants who are coming in who are fleeing persecution based on their sexual orientation or even their gender and if they were arrested for the crime of being queer in their country and then they come to Canada and it's seen that they have a criminal record and that's considered a criminal record in their country they can actually be persecuted for that in Canada and that's really concerning to me as a queer immigrant as well and so the other thing with this festival is that there's been a lot of intersections with the different programs and so with indigenous sovereignty, with immigration, um, with the queer and trans program that was on the Friday, with La Casa today, um, with the criminalization of dissent, we found that um, a lot of the films have had bits of each segment into it. Um, so I think we also need to look at how everything in this entire wonderful weekend has intersected. I'm going to stop babbling and hand it to the lovely, lovely person next to me. Hi everybody, I'm Cyrus. Um, I'm just totally caught up in what everyone was talking about and I'm just like, oh, now to switch to talking. Um, I, I, I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about abolition because one of the things that um, I guess is a thread that sort of connects all of the screenings and everything that we've talked about this past weekend is uh, that the system as we know it is not working. It's not making our communities safer or more secure. It's not making our families safer, our children safer. And it's certainly not making um, uh, life uh, more viable for so many of our communities. Um, and I think that, you know, the word abolition can be a very sort of frightening word, I think, for a lot of people. And this idea that we would live in a world without prison seems really actually somewhat preposterous, I think, to a lot of us. Um, and there's a reason for that. I mean, we're told so many stories about who goes to prison and why, and they're not the people that we just heard about. They're not, um, you know, the, the ways that our communities are targeted. That's not the story. The story in the paper is that there's really, really terrible people and that that's why we need prisons, because without prisons, um, terrible, terrible things are going to happen to us and, uh, and to our families. And in fact, actually, we know that that's not true, and we know that that's not who's going to prison, and we know that that's not why there are prisons. And in fact, the reason for telling these stories is so that we will be terrified to talk about abolition, 
because if we're afraid of even considering a possibility of a world without prisons, that means that prisons will keep happening and they are essential to creating money and power and control of particular populations that they don't want to have in control in Canada. I mean, the first police force of any kind in on Turtle Island was here to clear the land of indigenous people to make way for settlers. So the police and the prison industrial complex has always been implicitly connected to trying to control and be about power and be about money and domination. Um, the other thing that I think is really interesting about abolition is that it seems so big and it really does seem like, you know, this group of us here, although a big group is actually quite a small group when you think about how many prisons and det detention centers and jails are out there and the, the extent of the police force, and it seems to me sometimes impossible to imagine how we could actually shut it down and make a change. But I think that that's a tactic as well, is to make it seem so big and so giant when in fact there's lots of things that we're doing every single day that are part of abolition. Um, things like uh, community accountability, conflict resolution in schools, uh, community programming, harm reduction, needle exchanges, safer injection sites, working around decriminalizing sex work, working around um, decriminalizing drug use, uh, really challenging some of the new criminalization laws around HIV, not calling the police if your partner is HIV positive and you have a bad breakup. These are all actually abolitionist strategies of not going to the police and not going to the state to try to solve the, the, the situations that are happening within our communities. Um, and so if we think about it actually as these small things that are actually part of a larger movement that is abolition, well, now it actually starts to seem a little bit more possible. Um, and I think that this is one of the things that's so great about having festivals like this is that hopefully this is just the beginning of a conversation and then we can then move to actually starting to dream and imagine what, our, what we want our communities to look like and what does a community that's built on social justice actually look like. Uh, how do we treat each other? What do schools look like? Are there schools? You know, how do we get our food? Like all of those kind of things need to be reimagined perhaps so that then we don't, we're not perpetuating the system that we find ourselves in. Um, there's also this great, I mean, there's a lot of really great um, activism happening about people talking about prison, maybe more so than than in recent years. But we still often talk about political prisoners and then, I guess, prisoners who aren't inherently political just by the nature of the wording. And I think that, on the one hand, I think it's really significant to talk about the ways that, that there's a criminalization of dissent and a criminalization of activists and a real preventing of us doing activism and trying to make change. We need to talk about how that how that lands us in jail and how that is, there's a direct connection there. But we also need to really challenge this idea that there's also this supposedly, I guess, other group of people who do need to be in prison and who are supposed to be in prison and to really kind of change that because if you saw any of the, even just one of the films that screened today, you'd see that in fact it's just our people who are in prison. It's our friends and our lovers and our parents and our brothers and these are the people who are in prison and we're in prison because we don't have access to the things that we need to be able to survive and we don't have access to the right to self-determination and to live in this world the way that we want to and whether that means you know being able to access um, resources financial resources food support for our family um, education whatever it is those are the things that are that are you know leading to people communities being targeted um, and I also think that we need to spend a little bit of time talking about the ways that we have won in a lot of situations. I mean, this, you know, resisting prison expansion, I mean, that there's a lot of, actu there, there are a lot of cases where we actually have shut it down and we have stopped prisons from being built. In Toronto, I was part of this group called the Prisoners Justice Action Committee and we did this large campaign that was called the 81 Reasons Campaign and we were trying to stop the building of this huge super jail. And we didn't stop it being built, but we created, I guess, a little bit of momentum and we were inspired by a similar um, bit of organizing that had hap happened in California where they were going to be building a super jail and uh, the community actually did a, some really great activism and they stopped it from being built. And the activism looked a lot of different ways. There was like school walkouts, but there was also really a lot of organizing within the community who were being told this is the way that you're going to have jobs in your community. And so trying to do that work with community members to say, you know, this isn't really 
actually going to be creating jobs. This is going to be targeting your community in, in short term anyways. So they did some really great activism and they actually did stop the building of that. And I think that if we spend a little bit more time thinking about the ways that we are actually having some wins, I think that that will help to fuel some of our organizing. Um, and then lastly, I guess, uh, I think that there's still so much work as we're working on the outside to try to make changes and try to, I guess, begin trying to imagine another possibility. It's essential that the voices of prisoners and ex-prisoners are part of that conversation. And it's essential that we actually are going inside, whether going inside as volunteers to do art programs, uh, writing letters to people inside, um, you know, having you know, making arrangements to be, you know, volunteer on a phone line to be able to take calls from people uh, inside and really having those kind of connections. Um, I think that that's actually quite essential to uh, part of the work that we're doing because the divide of inside and outside is, is definitely a strategy of the state. And I was thinking about um, all of the things that all of you were saying about environmental racism and and uh, the criminalization of activism and and stuff around immigration and I think it's so telling that at this moment where really realistically in 10 or 20 years things are going to look dramatically different in the world whether we do nothing or not because the ice caps are melting and like like huge things are about to happen because of the state of the current environment and I think that it's very telling to me that at the moment when the Canadian government you know really first started speaking publicly or acknowledging the fact that the ice caps were melting at a dramatic rate the very the, the, their first statement about it was to say we need to start patrolling the waters Right? The first reaction to the fact that the entire North Pole is melting and is going to literally surround much of the land masses that human beings live on and that our food is grown on is to say, we need to send the military to patrol the waters. That says everything. That, there, that's the film festival. That's the, if you didn't come to the film festival, that was what we covered in the last three days. That is essentially a synopsis of what's happening. And so I think that, you know, we really, we have a lot of work to do, but I think that, you know, some of the work has already begun. And I think that things like this are actually abolitionist strategies for us to come together and talk. And I just wanted to end with a little um, statement. And this is uh, a statement that Asada Shakur made about her experience um, doing activism and uh, being in prison and then um, and then going to exile in Cuba where this is an, an interesting many people may or may not know this story but Asada Shakur was broken out of jail um, and fled and was able to get away and part of uh, when we were doing organizing around PJAC, our first film festival, we had um, a video. Uh, Laura Whitehorn had just gotten out of prison, and we did a video uh, interview, a video panel with her, and she talked about how her and Marilyn Buck drove the getaway car for Asada Shakur, and like it was just sort of this brilliant moment where they use this, the racism that's inherent to the prison industrial complex against it. And so they had these two middle-aged white women driving the getaway car. And so, of course, when they were like looking to try to see where Asada could have gone and what cars were around, they like totally drove away because they used the racism against them. And so I think that, anyways, that's uh, interesting strategies. So this is what she says. She says, um, part of being a revolutionary is creating a vision that is more humane and that is more fun too, that is more loving. It's really working to create something beautiful. And I think that as revolutionaries, that's what we're trying to do is create something beautiful. And we need to make more time to come together and actually imagine what that beautiful thing is and what it's looking like and how it's being shaped. So all power to the people. Yeah, that was amazing. Thank you so much. And I think that you really did um, cover like what we did over the duration of the film festival and bring attention to the fact that the prison industrial complex is a set of interests, and it's built on a set of you know a set of interests that are about imperialism, colonialism militarism uh, and that you know there's people who benefit from this and I think as Ashanti had said as well that you know we often talk about racism but it's white supremacy that is the issue around um, holding these systems in place so um, yeah there's so many connections we can make and I hope that uh, people here uh, want to contribute and want to ask questions and want to maybe make some comments on what you've seen over the period of the last two and a half days
Uh, so I don't know in terms of filming if you need to have the mic. I'm happy to bring it to you, or at least part way. If you want to... <laughs> yeah, do you know what? We can... Oh, there's a cord coming. My question is about... Um, where abolition has uh, kind of come in the academic circles, and if that's even necessary for uh, for more kind of uh, steps to towards a solution, because like the environmental thing, although maybe the responses haven't been that that you know clear from the government side, it's acknowledged as a problem at least, and we're growing into a green a greener I think generation, but with uh, prisoner's justice and abolition it's not as obviously popular and sometimes academia gives that you know that that kind of anchor to to move forward so has that happened is it happening and and also does it need to happen well i mean certainly there's lots of uh there is a lot of um, academic writing about the prison industrial complex. And I'm thinking of the work of Ray Reese, who did a sort of like her whole dissertation and PhD research was about black women in prison in Canada. And her work is amazing. And she's done some really, really important uh, writing and, and teaching about that. And of course, Julia Sudbury writing about uh, California. Um, uh, Viv, what's Viv's last name? Salahana, uh, also in academia. So there's there's certainly lots of examples of, um, of people doing that work. And I guess I would say that um, the most important thing I think we could do in a conversation about abolition is to talk in a way that we all understand each other. And I think that sometimes we get into... We, we, we miss the point of communication, which I think is actually so that you can understand what I'm saying. And I think that sometimes there can be this tension between activism and academia, which I, I guess that's a panel for another day. But I would say that, you know, I think that there's some really great writing out there, but that we also need to um, centralize some of the voices, not only within, within academic settings. I kind of just want to say ditto. <laughs> Um, but I think also, like I'm going to speak specifically to London, and I think university, universities should really be grounds on which um, students are really encouraged to do critical thinking, students are really encouraged to go out into the communities and work within the communities, and I think there has been too much of a trend recently where universities are being operated as for profit and students are not encouraged to critically think and they're encouraged to really be siloed on the campuses um, and I think that's really dangerous because it creates this disconnect and it helps to really engender this feeling of um, privilege that a lot of times students can't really recognize and so I think more needs to be done within the university system. I think more needs to be done in academia. There is quite a few really amazing writing out there. I know when I was doing a lot of research in terms of community accountability and transformative justice, especially within people of color communities, it was really hard to find really accessibly written um, principles and stories and ways of moving forward into transformative justice. and there needs to be more and if that can come out of the university in a way that's accessible in a way that is encouraging critical thinking that's encouraging students to go out into the communities to go out into detention centers into the jails and to really recognize other people's lived experiences and to understand that um, I am all for it I don't think enough is being done and I think everyone from different circles needs to be doing this work not only community activists not only folks who've had lived experiences uh, I definitely agree with everything that's being said I would just I'd say the the big the biggest risk for me that's been touched on is that disconnect between campus and the community. Like st students very much are, like Trini said, like siloed up. And I think that, okay, well, I'm just going to throw this out there. Universities are colonial institutions. They are. They teach you Western science and like as an end without, and I'm not saying that science is invaluable. I'm saying that there are different ways of looking at the world and experiencing the world that universities aren't teaching you and I think that very much 
academics participation in prison abolition is really important but I think that in practice the solutions are going to come from grassroots communities and uh, speaking like as a member of the urban native community here the we have the solutions this knowledge exists we very much practice it and it's a matter of um, that being viewed as a legitimate legitimate way of deter like living right so yeah that's just what I would add to that is it's all important but I think that students really should take the time to um, come to things like this right like that uh, are going on already in the community because if not your writing's not really going to reflect real experiences so and I would be really interested in more people that have um, been through the prison system writing about what they would like to see in terms of justice, right? So. I have one more thought on the on the thing, on the issue. Um, I just shared this morning with some friends what I heard last week. You know, from an MBA, you know, 26 years old MBA, all on the way to success, right? And he asked me that uh, why we needed art and museums. I, 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 I'm still shocked, so I'm repeating all this the whole day because I couldn't believe that I was listening to that, right? I said, uh, what I <laughs> just, I didn't know what to say to him, you know. I said, well, you know, a society and a culture, a human <laughs> being collective with no arts is like a human being with no soul, with no soul, with no principle, no ethics. What the hell do you think that you are? Oh, you are a monster, you know? But see, the issue here. We say, well, um, who is going to study what in this kind of society? The problem is it really, really complex. But when you say, when you say, no, we need public education. Okay, public. Okay, so the guy doesn't have to because this is a, a critical thing. But it's not just public because public. What kind of interest they are representing the state? Okay, one issue is the tuition and all that thing. But se second issue, what kind of citizen we're forming, right? So it's not just not public, public education. Yes, public education. I mean, homeboy, the state, right? So, but I think as the with the uh, student movement in Quebec and that we were in a way in, involved in on this, you know, when a guy has to go to university knowing that at the end of the day he will owe forty thousand dollars and if you put a master's, another 25000 or something like that, the housing and everything, so, you know, the guy, you know, is advised right there to say, well, I need to be an engineer <laughs> to get a job, maybe with uh, Barry Gold or something, right, uh, in order to pay these bills, you know, for life, you know, $300 a month, $500 a month. But the issue is not just public education. The problem is the status quo. That's the problem. Um, I have a question for, for uh, I, I take it you're from Colombia, right? Yes. Okay. So um, I have a question for the Canadian and for the abolitionists too. Um, my first question is, how do you feel in Canada now that you're saying that the government, especially the United States in the Canadian government following, how you feel comfortable, how you feel for your security, how you feel for speaking openly? And also, how do you feel about the uh, the breaking of the Geneva Convention Accords, uh, like in Colombia, when the police, uh, the army used the ambulance of the Red Cross to attack the people? And that's one question for for you. And the other question for the for the native, uh, you know, the native rights in Canada. You say the first they take is uh, with suspicion any letter from any native organization or native tribe that wants to represent uh, or ask questions about, you know, the whatever issue, the safety or the water or whatever. Now, why do you have to go through letters first? Why don't you go directly get a lawyer or get an organization that you know that you're going to be mistreated to begin with? So why waste the time and do that, not be prepared to answer 
better wh what you're going to be, like in a complex situation already. And for the abolitionist, I know that you say that there are many ways, that like uh, conflict resolution, etc., instead of sending people to jail, etc. Um, but eventually, I think it doesn't really need to be abolished the jails. It needs to be abolished the police. The, the I mean the 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 people who dominate these things. So it's like a, to me, it's like a, trying to cure the cancer just with painkillers. You know, like, you have to go to the root. So I don't know. If I want your opinion on that. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Um, I'll answer the first question, right? Second. Uh, one thing, uh, the, the first portion of the question is that uh, how we feel in Canada. I just want to answer with a, just a little sentence. We start to fear the same fear again. We were, we thought that we were coming to a safe place that you can openly express what you believe and think, uh, but that's not the case. So the same fear we have in the 80s, we are feeling the same fears again. And the thing is that, uh, I, I repeat this, maybe it's our fault, or so, but uh, uh, Colombia is not a priority here. Uh, and uh, and even in South America, the Colombians are fighting quite a lonely fight because the revolutionary left even has been cornered sometimes by the social democrats and everything, you know. So so this is a a fight that is lasting for long, and uh, we feel quite alone. But uh, the fear the fear is there because. You can be extradited for what you think, you know. You can be, and this is the, the, what is, that's the objective, to terrorize you, to annihilate you, to avoid your mobility and your expression, just to corner you and to, for you to feel fear to the bone. Well, I get the so, yeah, yeah, okay. Oh, yeah. So, it's not my question, right? But uh, I think that it's very important with regards to the second question. In my point of view, I won't answer the question, but it's very important to visualize yourself, to make yourself public. Because these guys, CISAS is coming to your door, you know, and the first sentence is to threat you with anything. And the second is, but if you want to work for us, we can arrange this. But everything, but don't come into your friends. Don't publicize to this. Don't make don't make this public. So it's in secret because they are breaking the laws all the time, their own rules. So it's very important to be public. Even if we wear three cats and dogs on the street, it's important, and it's very important. Uh, the second question is with regards to the uh, Geneva Courts and the international criminal law and so on. The establishment of Colombia have, have killed a million people in a hundred years. The paramilitary forces killed in the last ten years about 40,000 people. The Chilean tragedy or the Salvatorian tragedy or the Guatemalan tragedy. We, numbers in Colombia are huge, are, are terrible. No, but but the establishment, the paramilitary forces are not an independent force. The dead squads are part of the establishment. It's a strategy made by the national, you know, the, the, the doctrine of the low intensity war, the doctrine of the national security, <coughs> no? So, 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 uh, uh, the, the establishment breaks the laws all the time, but uh, they own the media, they own the radio, they, so they can portray on other people how Gerald bad they are. Yeah. Uh, you know, a safe shelter, you know? No, or, or to say, if you come here as a refugee, 
you come as soon as you ch you can be a refugee from three different forms, CR one or whatever. So one is from your country of origin, the other one is from a neighboring country, and the other one when you, you touch Canadian soil. As soon as you touch Canadian soil, you are a landed immigrant. Yes. Right? But uh, you have to wait for three years or whatever, three years, uh, 365 days to apply for your uh, uh, citizenship. So what happened, you know, is that in these three years, all these security certificates and everything, because they apply to, to residents, not to citizens. So, of course, Canada endorsed these international uh, treaties and all the things, the Refugee Convention. You cannot deport a person who has been tortured or whose life is in danger to the same country. But uh, what they do, you know, like happened with the Syrian doctor and everything, Caesar immediately, you know, this is the file of the guy and send the, that back. So, of course, they are, <laughs> but uh, they are the, who are playing, uh, they are the, uh, they pretend to be the winners of, of the game. They are the, the, the game by the horns, right? So, 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 they, see, the, the whole criteria of who is good and bad and things like that. They apply the law as they want. They are, the, you know, Colombian drug traffickers and, 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 People from the dead squads uh, they, that confess their crimes have been perking, uh, uh, serving maybe eight years in jail with 50% of reduced sentence and everything. And a human rights activist can be condemned up to 40 years or 60 years with the new modifications because all these free trade agreements mine all come together. They reform the prison system, and now in Colombia, life. Uh, pre Prison for life is illegal, is un unconstitutional, but uh, they can sentence you to up to 60 years. So it's a, it's a lifetime sentence. So they can do whatever they want, right? It's, it's, it, I mean, it's what we contradict. Yeah, the letter, so okay, let's do the letter, but uh, let's go. And how we are going to transform this? It's not going to be uh, around the coffee table. It's not. It won't. We, we, we wish. Yeah, for sure. A lot of, especially I find the UN Declaration on in, uh, the Rights of Indigenous People, same thing. In, in theory, it seems really good, but there's a huge disconnect between that actually being implemented in our communities. And just before I answer your second question, going off what you're saying about us breaking, like Canada's breaking their own, their own laws at, at this point, um, when I went to pick up my prosecutor's papers, I was originally um, arrested and detained for disrupting a federal hearing, <laughs> and then um, the <laughs> thanks. And then the na um, the National Energy Board, which is their own body of jurisdiction, decided that they um, they so they opened a criminal investigation on me and closed it that same day. So when I went to pick up my prosecutor's papers, they had actually all these notes about surveilling me and. Um, uh, of what the most alar well wasn't really alarming, but the, basically they tried to peg me as like I was leading Occupy London protesters to the hearing. So um, this was, but this surveillance when I actually it was called a street check, and when I actually called to inquire about it and I talked to Legal Aid about it, they actually informed me that that was completely illegal because they were what was um, authorizing the surveillance to be part of my these papers was the um, criminal investigation so once they closed that they actually weren't supposed to be street checking me which is a, it's, a for, it's a form of violence right like I'm not the only person that lives in my house where there's cop cars sitting out front right that is it's uh, it's a form of assault like it's very not appropriate um, so second question of yours about the letters um, so it's really complicated. It's not um, two First Nations. I can't. I believe um, Amjanong was one that had um, the band had uh, paid a lawyer for representation at the hearings, and I believe the other one was um, the Chippewas of the Thames. And um, so the. There's two different forms of government kind of co coexisting, and it's some places there, there's more attention than others, but um, bans are, um, were imposed by Canada. So even though they used to be imposed literally with Indian agents in the room, and then there's the traditional form of government. So for existence, the Haudenosaunee of the Grand River, um, there's the Confederacy Council, which is their traditional form of government that's been around way longer than 
Canada, and then there's the Band Council, which was colonially imposed. And um, so there's very much a lot going on within Native politics too. <laughs> so, um, for instance, the the Confederacy Council submitted a letter, but they were less um, ex they were um, they weren't expecting things to change like that. So there was more mobilization by them to uh, re re like predicting that you know this process isn't actually going to um, like provide us any solutions or meet any of our needs. As some are very much more engaged in the process, like there's a huge spectrum. So. So how do you compare this with the case in Oka when they, 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 they didn't wait for the court to decide? I mean, actually the court ruled against them, right, in Oka. Mm -hmm. So what happened next is, well, I don't know what's your opinion on what happened. Oh, I don't really feel like it's my place to <laughs> say too much about that. I don't really know. Um, yeah, like, I would say that it, there is um, some uh, strengths in going through the actual process because it's just showing, you know, we've, we've been engaged all along and this is why this isn't working. This is why this is undemocratic and uh, illegitimate. And um, like a lot of us that, that have been organizing for a while kind of realize those things. We know like, okay, the NEB is corrupt. Okay, it's the, they're acting in the interests of Enbridge and other oil corporations. They're not going to make what the decision that's best for the people. But a lot of people haven't, they haven't went through that process where they, they submitted letters and it was turned down and where they really didn't feel like their, their voice was being heard and they still, ha they still hold a lot of um, like hope in the system. So I feel like it, that, like just allowing people to go through that process is, is a really powerful thing. Um, I would just say that when talking about uh, abolitionist strategies and trying to, you know, um, the prison industrial complex, part of that is uh, the police system. And I think that, so, th so definitely that's part of what we would need to get rid of or to think of alternatives to. But also, um, I'm not sure if he meant like no police, but yes, jails, because I would say no, no to neither, to, no, no to either. <laughs> Uh, I'll let somebody out this time, yeah? first time. Okay, and then you can be up if you want next. Hello, okay. Um, so, I, I'm going to say two things. First of all, uh, which is the, the Geneva Conventions, I think, not really regarded by much folks anymore. So even here, like at the G20, you had police arriving and ambulances and medical supplies being taken from people. And also, I want to say about security certificates, I just looked it up to make sure just now, but actually um, people who have been identified or considered Canadian citizens have also been held under cert security certificates and tortured and been forced to confess that maybe they weren't really born Canadians. So that's also uh, just to help us feel more secure, I guess. <laughs> uh, something I wanted to say. Uh, also, <laughs> um, the, uh, my question is, I guess, Giselle sort of spoke earlier that you folks were, had a range of positions, whether it's from abolitionist to reformist. And I think, uh, quite articulately, the argument for abolitionism has been made. Um, but I'm curious uh, if any of you, either personally or the organizations you're here representing, identify as reformists, what that looks like, your reformism, if any of you do, in fact. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, which is cool. I, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm curious what that would look Me. like if you are, right? <laughs> so if not. Do you want to speak to reformists, like John Howard, E. Fry, any of us? Yeah. I'm well, I think I could speak. I think I could speak to some aspect of it. Yeah, I'm curious. Yeah. I'm curious. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, you, yeah, should I go first, or you want to? Yeah. Okay. So I think there's, um, yeah, I think there's lots of different ways of looking at reform, which is. I know I'm a good team. Oh, yeah. yeah. You're gonna get. You're up next. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I keep letting you know. It's good. Um, so just to say that, like, I think that um, reformist um, tactics look in lots of different ways, right? So you've got organizations like uh, John Howard E. Fry. They're like, okay. Uh, conditions in prisons really suck right now, and we need to improve things for people in this moment. So, you know, we actually do need uh, better programming inside, and we do need, we can't have overcrowding anymore, and we actually do need needle exchanges in prisons if people are going to use. We actually do need tattooing programs or methadone maintenance inside. So I think there's, like, reform-type things that need to be happening now because people are in prison, and unless you know, in, in, until we have abolition, there's things that need to improve for people inside, and it's unrealistic to think that, you know, that we can just let people kind of rot inside without trying to do it. And yet the argument to that is also if, you know, in some ways you want people suffering so they revolt in some ways, right? Like, I think that's, that's an argument that's being made. It's not necessarily my argument. I'm just saying it's an argument that's made. And then I think that you've got other reforms that can look like, and I think, you know, we often talk about it. If we're not going to have prisons, um, you know, we need to be putting money not in prisons, but put it in the front end. So we need better housing. We need social programs. We need harm reduction programs. We need to make sure that we have, you know, all the things in the community where people's needs are met. So when people get out, we need to be sure that there's actually programs and things for people to do, um, and as well as to prevent people from going into prison in the first place. So we need alternatives to incarceration. We need things like restorative or transformative practices or circle sentencing, anything that's going to divert people from those practices, right? But even those things can look like reform when you're talking about white supremacy, imperialism, colonialism, because once you abolish the penal system, and we're talking the entire system of police, prisons, all of those things, and you're talking about anti-colonialism, anti-imperialism, you're essentially talking about revolution, right? We're talking about complete social transformation revolution. So we're talking about completely dismantling a colonial imperial system. So when we talk about abolition, in some ways, we're talking about revolution <laughs> because you can't really talk about it if you're not talking about it from those perspectives. So I think that, oh, good. So I think that, so I think that that is like kind of the extreme of working from a reform-based attitude where lots of people, you know, and people will say, well, if we don't have prisons, what are we going to have? You know, what will we do with the dangerous few? And I think they're valid questions and they're questions we need to address. But I think when you start addressing social problems, if you're going to look at it from a reform point of view and start saying, okay, we're going to have better housing, we're going to look after, uh, you know, women who are beating in their homes and the kids that are growing up in those homes, and we're going to address victims' needs and all of those things. Um, I just forgot what I was saying. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> I think there's more there, but oh, I think uh, what was. Do you want to take off from there? Well, I would just say that that's where the con that's you were asking about you know so then what are the connections or what are the ways that you connect and certainly in doing the organizing that we've done together I mean yeah. there's always those there are moments when you're working in a broad coalition where then the abolition question comes up and then you see that actually oh okay we do actually okay 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 yeah well, we're coming from a little bit of a different perspective but there were these mutual things that we agreed on and those are the often the things that we can kind of find some solidarity and common ground. I guess I'd just say about the dangerous few part because that's the question that always comes up when people say it. So the goal is if you're starting to put energy into preventive services that you're going to have less people going into prison. If you eliminate, you know, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, racism, and all of those things, there's just going to be less people in prison. And then you've got, you know, what is considered the psychopath, sociopaths, right? But I think even when we talk about those populations, there's been no energy or resources put into actually figuring out what happens there. And I think that as we start to look at um, how, like, neuroplasticity in brain, how, you know, our brains are changing and how they develop and how they develop when they're in poverty or when people develop brains, you know, in racism and colonialism and all of those things. And then you look at, you know, people aren't, they don't want to be sociopaths or psychopaths. It's not a life choice. You know, there's something wrong with people's brains in that situation. Um, and if we put time and resources into figuring out what that is and what that means and what we can do about those things, then we're actually solving bigger problems. And that's kind of a, like, that's the basic answer around the dangerous view that people come up with. And I would say that, you know, part of what, you know, there's this whole conversation about disability in prison that we don't have very often or often enough. And I think that that's like, you know, there's, that's a huge 
question, right? Because it actually is part of that conversation. Like, there's the part of the conversation that's about how, um, you know, there's such rampant um, ableism and how that r relates to, you know, lack of access to a lot of things, which leads to targeted policing of particular communities, which leads to an overrepresentation of disabled people in prison. Then there's like the ways that prisons themselves are disabling and how they create all all sorts of um, problems. But then there's this other question, right? Like that, you know, prisons become alternative ways of just mar like just shoving away m mental like different mental states and different experiences and then people get out and then go back in and get out and go back in and of course that's totally exacerbating the problem mm -hmm. Did from an abolitionist that? perspective <laughs> um, yeah does any does anybody else want to respond to that or have any kind of comments or questions about it yes Uh, yeah. I want to comment on that. <laughs> um, I think that uh, when we put first what we need to be done in order to something happen, that ha that maybe never happened, right? Historically, you know, we have you know we have examples like the the Maoistic uh, perception of how we need to transform society. I mean, if you have to spend a hundred years for, for people to think and to be educated of what they have to do, you know, if there is an objective cause for a conflict that people have to put an end into a, that, we cannot uh, spend a hundred years. I mean, I think that what she's saying is that, uh, I mean, what we need is a is my interpretation. We agree in the part that is what we need is a revolu uh, revolution. Nobody's going to uh, 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 think about how to treat the poor or why poverty or why, you know, they don't give a shit at the present moment, right? So we need, you know, to go there and to overthrow the system and to start thinking and solving all these things. I don't see abolition as part of the actual context. Because the establishment is all what we are, we are here just to fight the establishment. So it's going to come like education, kids, kids will ha have access to free education and all that thing, and you know, uh, but that will happen if we overthrow this crap, the whole system. So I, I think that the common ground for us, for example, uh, we are on the revolutionary left. I don't know that reformism where we are in there. We are human beings that want a better world. Mm -hmm. I even feel uneasy when we talk about, oh, no, I'm a political activist. No, I'm a human being. Yeah. And as a human being, I have a political raciocinus. Right? So, so I, I think that the common ground or the common platform to come together is to struggle to overcome this colonial imperialistic system. How we're going to do from all our ideolo ideological diversity, well, it's up to everyone. But uh, we have coincidences that we can work together, and we will. We have to start imagining and thinking about the possibilities of what that could look like. I know for me, I don't, I want to be somewhere where I can help grow bees and spend time making art. 
That's what I want to be doing with my time and this move towards industrialization that was supposed to somehow, like that's part of this whole conversation and that's led to so many of the environmental situations and the way that we just are working, 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 working and not having time to actually think about revolution or to think about another, t- another way that society could look. Um, and I want to work like, you know, maybe eight hours a week. That's what I want to work. I want to work eight hours a week. I want to love people. I want to grow bees. I know, like, that's what I want personally. But I think together we actually have to start imagining what does it actually look like? Like, how do we spend our time? You know, what, what is, like, I, I don't know. Just, I'm, I just think that that, I, I absolutely agree. And I think that, you know, social change, like, well, I think it goes back to what the quote that I saw, to, you know, where she says that, you know, this revolutionary, act of being a revolutionary is about imagining a beautiful place, like this other place that we could get to uh, and that maybe we're already on the road to. Um, uh, do you want to say something? A little, a little something. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That, you know, the, 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 the other thing is that, um, never mind. I, I, I want <laughs> no, but uh, the, the, the other thing is how, you know, people get together for what? Why we are here together, you know? Psych- psychoanalyst, uh, psychiatrician, psychologist, you know, why people do things for free and won't put their butts in, on the edge for a fortune or whatever. You know, this, why is the motivation for us to be here together? And this is, you know, I want to make a quick parallel between how people resist here and how people resist in other countries where you have the conflict here, you have people coming, raping your wife, you have people being displaced, bomb here, bomb there, right? And this is very common all around the world, but Canada and United States, you know, the North, right? Is, you know, we resist and we come together not to theorize about what kind of society we want to reach. We get together to solve a problem. It's not here, you know, because y- y- you kind of go to work and then you have your boring weekends or whatever. I don't know. People start building ideas and think, right? And to say, people, when you are in poverty, when you are down there on possibilities or anything, you just don't have just to work for, that to, for you work on your survival. And if you need a uh, transportation in the river, and it's not happening because of military control, people get together, put a boat together, and solve the problem. People don't have food. People get together, grow food, and eat. It's like what you say. We talk evolution all the time. Mm-hmm. If we try to solve the problems here, instead of calling the police, that's a working. Th- but a uh, is you know is 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 we are here together to solve a need maybe the common need the common ground is because we feel like outsiders in this system for the system status quo we are a bunch of sick people so we are here together to transform the realities the future I mean would be for good <laughs> for better. Uh, you said that um, much better than I was going to say it, but I think that what you've reiterated is for people who saw Ashanti's talk, um, that Ashanti said something similar, right? Like we create change through our work together and, you know, the abolitionist movement is how we organize together and how we come together is how we start decolonizing anti-imperialism. And I think what Keisha did in her video for people who saw that on Friday night was fucking, it's brilliant. Like what she talked about was was about how do we... Um, stop, um, like how do we resist the prison industrial complex in our own minds and our own lives and how we reproduce those things within ourselves and in the world that we live in. So in some of those ways it's really about, and and she talked about it in her film, it's around self-love, but also for ourselves to challenge ourselves to look at how we reproduce these systems within our relationships and within our organizing and within our work. So the change comes through doing work together differently than we've been doing it. Some of us doing it differently would be doing. Some people have been doing it great. Um, did you want to add anything to that? I think there's been a couple of other questions. I know Mohammed had a question. And Brett had a question as well. Do you? Yeah, Mohammed, do you want to? And we still haven't gotten to this gentleman. Right? It's, it's kind of a comment slash uh, question. It touches on 
on that. I want to ask actually one question about um, an integrationist approach versus, uh, you know, anti-establishment approach and whether there's room for kind of collaboration because in whatever movement you're part of, there's always people that are more progressive and there's people on different kind of, act, like that believe in different ways of acting towards change. So, and this is, I think, uh, any movement you look at, you're going to find this. So, and there's unity in, in a purpose. I haven't decided personally where, where I am <laughs> sometimes, but I just maybe if you wanted to comment on that and if there are kind of more progressive or I wouldn't sh shouldn't say progressive, I should say maybe more integrated models of change if those are hopeful. And the second thing was what you just talked about, about what our communities look like um, or what a family looks like. Like, uh, personally, I have more questions than I have solutions because I look at my own community and I say, we have serious issues. We don't have real authority. We don't have any kind of structure that uh, can make decisions in an effective way. There's abuse within our own, s within our own communities, within our, within our own families. And I, I feel like unless there's a really clear solution, we're going to keep fa like falling. We won't really have anything to, to model for other people to see. So I don't know. It, 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 I guess it's going to take a lot of commitment to actually change things within our own groups and the, the networks that we have already and then partnering if we're if we're looking towards a real you know revolution quote unquote but maybe some thoughts on uh, integrated versus and yeah I was just going to ask what you mean by integrated integrated with who well well, integrated with the with decision making, like that's why I asked about academia, is because because they can kind of show things without being totally involved to people that make decisions. And uh, the question is, is that valid or not? Like sometimes academia is, is like we said, it's a it's a colonial institution that can serve colonial interests. But then we've seen examples of how, like real academics, can actually provide solutions for a society, and it and it does actually make it. Uh, healthier and more just. So that's why I, I, I have issues maybe with uh, integrationists within any movement with the establishment, but at the same time I don't want to go and start a fight with them when I know they're kind of moving in the same direction on cer certain things. Go ahead. I would completely disagree. They're not moving in our direction. Okay. the more militant approach I mean even if you don't want to take part in it it opens up more possibilities for doing other things often like someone brought up Oka earlier I'd say one of the differences with Oka and some of the stuff that's come after is in Oka was like one of the first of those big incidents like it changed some of the, the context that's happened for all those things since and put more pressure on the establishment to deal with them in a little less vicious ways. Right? And I think it's already been brought up like to really, if we're really talking about ab abolishing prisons or changing them in a really dramatic way, I mean, that is revolutionary, right? Like there's going to be a huge conflict because it's that's part of how they deal with the system that keeps everything in place. And so they're not going to let us just whittle that away on them that I've never seen that happen anywhere the only places it's ever had a dramatic change it was done basically violently and pretty quickly like I don't know one of my favorite examples is during the beginning of the Spanish Revolution they emptied out a jail and formed one of the most infamous militia columns in the war the uncontrollables were basically freed prisoners well, anyways, there's just I just think even even if you don't want to participate in the most militant actions, that you, it's important to recognize that there's a lot of value in it. 
and that it opens up a lot for other ways to uh, to approach it. I just don't think you're going to bring those people on through persuasion mostly, right? Like you can't sit and talk to police and prison guards and expect that we're going to convert them in mass over to our side. Usually I think what history's shown is when push comes to shove, they'll have to pick a side like everybody mm -hmm. else. And that if they do shift over to our side, that's that's a major power shift and tends to begin like signal the beginning of the end for a regime but I mean it, uh, to me it almost always comes down to conflict and then they'll have to choose a side like the soldiers in Egypt and or the police you know they switch side during a conflict they didn't have a big circle and talk about it you know I just don't think persuasion in a situation like that is going to get you almost zero like even even if they want to even if I'm a prison guard and I don't like what's going on what am I going to do you know short of leaving your job most of them are entrenched in it because they got kids they want to put in school, you know, a mortgage to pay. It's a big decision for them. They're either going to jump out of it or they're not. And I don't think persuasion is the way to go. <coughs> sure. <coughs> Give us the reforms. Yeah, I'd like to, not today. Well, I. I it's okay. <coughs> I think that you, Mohammed, have pointed out a very important point on the, all this struggle. Uh, one of the costs, one of the high costs of the struggle and the evolution of your conscious, conscience and the, the, your political position, this doesn't come for free. The cost is high, really high. It's not just having your relatives murdered, displaced or whatever, incarcerated or, or you know, you being harassed and all that thing. The other political, the other cost of all this is, are, is the fragmentation of the families, the fragmentation of communities. You know, because here, like, is the case. You know, it, within one family, you can have a right winner and a left winner and a medium center guy. Well, but uh, and and it's a huge cost. It's a it's the destruction of the communities and the families. But I really think, you know, it's my personal perception that we need, you know, two things. One is that, uh, as you mentioned, it, 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 it's very powerful to let people realize themselves and their process they have. You have people maybe with 40 years on the struggle and all that thing that they have X or Y political position. That's fine. But the new guy, the new community, they don't have running water. They block a highway for the to have running water so what happened with they block a highway the police the police or the military comes right the military comes and and they kick them to the bone right and uh, so they say okay they, but uh, that happened they don't block the highway just just out of the blue before they have gone to the mayor office to the city hall 10 times 20 times thousand letters and everything this is the process of how a person like paulo freire in brazil the Jesuits, and then it builds your conscious, progressive conscious, conscience, right? That people by themselves realize that there is no way within the political system to get things through. Through. I mean, why to put, you know, a, 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 a walking clinic where there is no need over there? You know, they are not interested in that. This is the collateral damage that Bush talked about, right? Who cares? Right? 
So, so, so this is one thing, and we, you know, whatever, whatever our position is in politics, we have to respect that. But that doesn't mean that politically we don't get irritated or think. You know, I hate. I'm 55 years old, and I hate that. You know, for 30 years I've I've been unable to talk to my parents and my sisters on, about politics. You know. My mother, you know, I come from a Christian kind of thing, uh, Catholic, South American, male center culture, right? And uh, with the conflict, one, uh, my, my mom passed away, and my sister said, my mom was a saint. I said, what? <laughs> Why do you say that? You say, my mom <coughs> said at some point, right, that are all that people, you know, the people who is threatening the peace, the stable peace in Colombia, very right wing and Catholic, religious to the bone, a Catholic religion, no? And say, I, I have nothing against religion. Believe me. So, but I do, but anyway. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's very difficult it's very, when you have no, wor no words and just, anyway, whatever, no? But I said, my mom was one of the that said, who said publicly, you know, within the family and everything, all that people who is threatening the, the order and, the, you know, the peace in Colombia, kill them, kill all them. Say, I told my sister, my mom, give me a death sentence. So, why do you say, what is, what is a saint for you? But that's one of the points that I wanted to, to share. The other thing is that uh, regardless of our political views, if we agree or disagree, might be very hot encounters and everything. We have to have the ability. The social movement is everything. We don't own this process. Nobody does. Everybody that is out there doing here and there, that's what the social movement is. Right? And there you have uh, 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 all the, the whole variety of position, education, background, and political consciousness. Conscience, sorry. Consciousness or conscience? So, 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 again, I like this nugget. You know, we can come together and, and go ahead, you know, go forward. But the, the other exercise is that the people, we do have to agree within the left. I think that uh, all the fragmentation of the left, that's, that's, Painful, right? This uh, is stupid, you know. But anyway, so if we, in all this process, I do respect that. But the people who don't agree with the revolutionary left and all that thing, right? At least has to respect, right? We cannot go and uh, there and criminalize our own people because they are taking this or that position. I just wanted to uh, quickly address kind of the, the second part of what you were talking about, about um, like issues within the community. And I think it's just important to remember here that what um, transformative justice is going to look like is going to be drastically different in every community and that we can't expect it to be just just one way, right? And um, the um, traditional Michif um, governance structure was very much connected to the clan system, which is connected to the land. But like, I think that I just wanted to emphasize what Humberto was saying about um, how the fragmentation of families has really uh, affected this, because I think that has a large role in it, right? Like, if we're not able to actually find ways to communicate these these really intense subjects that can be extremely divisive, if we're not finding ways to do it respectfully and with a good mind, then we're we're really not helping ourselves or each other, right? So, it's a, a little bit of creativity required, but I think it's good to be having these discussions, regardless of you know how pissed off our parents get sometimes. <laughs> Um, I think, Mohammed, in terms of you talking about uh, your experience with your friend who's a prison guard who seems uneasy with what's going on, I think my perspective, at least, it goes back to what Sarah says, when individuals are in prison, we need to be looking at the root cause of 
what put them in there in the first place, whether they didn't have access to social housing, access to money for food, um, whether they're growing up in a society that has um, rape culture and so just continues to emphasize that it's okay to, for women abuse and that has put landed them there. And I think it's looking at the system I don't think we can work with at all. That is a system that is very much colonial based, that is very much corrupt, that is very much built upon the premise of gaining power in society. However, I think a lot of the times we tend to forget that within that system there are also individuals. And individuals within that system can be uneasy. And so we need to look at why that individual is in the system. You know, is it simply because it was the only job that they could get and they have a family they need to provide for, whatever that family looks like. If there are certain needs, um, they need to pay for medication, they need to pay for food, they need to pay for housing, and that's all they can get. We need to be looking at the society structure that's put them into that position. And I think work can be done with these individuals on an individual basis, just not on a system basis. Um, my other response would be that a lot of times there's a lot of dialogue about sexism, racism, um, heterosexism in society. And we talk about, for example, in the anti-violence against women movement, the idea of stranger danger and how society perpetuates this myth that it's a stranger that's going to assault you. And I think within um, the prison system, we have a bit of that same kind of myth going on, that these are very violent individuals in society that end up in the prisons. And so we need the prisons. And we're not looking at the fact that it's not violent, dangerous members of society, let's look at, okay, the system that has created these individuals, who has put into place um, situations that individuals, you know, have to commit robbery, have to commit theft, to simply survive, and what that is doing to our communities, and also looking at their racialized communities, their marginalized communities, um, who do not play into this industrial complex because of the abuse that's always perpetrated by officers. And so the damage that is being done to these communities when they hide things that are happening, when they hide abuse, when they hide violence because they don't have anywhere to go to and they don't want to, in a sense, put their fellow comrades in a situation of danger, in a situation of being thrown into the prison industrial system and what damage that is doing, whereas if there was an alternative means of justice, whether there was you know, community sentencing circles, whether there was community accountability processes, these situations would be brought more to light and they would actually be community healing and community resolution in terms of what is happening and we'd be looking at the roots of what's going on in society. I don't really have much to add because that was I totally agree with what everyone has said. The only thing I would, I guess, point to is, because you were asking about academia earlier, too, is the right, like Audre Lorde has written a lot about relating across difference and how we have to get to a place where we're able to relate across difference. And I, I guess I would just offer that, that that's going to somehow have to be part of how we're going to learn to live with each other, hopefully, um, because the planet's going to make it, um, you know, for a really, really long time. We're going to have to figure out how to, yeah, relate across difference. Yeah. I just wanted, like, the, the question I think is interesting um, and something I just want to put in that the notion of not talking or not trying to create space <coughs> to have a with someone because uh, their way of making change is different, I think is, like, a really kind of sometimes a problematic way to phrase it when we're thinking about out there when we're in our own activist communities. There are like, sometimes I don't want to talk to men or straight people because they act out violence against me. I totally understand why some people see me as a settler or a white person and wouldn't want to talk to me because I'm acting violence out against them all the time, right? So this is in our communities and who are we going to talk to? If we don't start creating safe ways to renegotiate what, what a healthy world looks like and try and include as many people as possible. That is awesome. Um, uh, this is the worst thing I have to do really now is that it's actually 7 o'clock and I need to take Cyrus and Nick and Arms to the, to the train station. Um, but it's such a great discussion and I know there were some leftover questions that didn't get, to, uh, get asked and dialogue that didn't get to happen and hopefully this is just the beginning of these discussions uh, for us to continue to, yeah, get to engage with each other in this way and get to ask good, tough, interesting questions and get to have some good dialogue. Um, 
Now, I also feel like if you know if people want to stick around and actually have longer conversation, you're welcome to do it. Um, but I would like to say a special thanks to Curtis and Mike here, our tech people, for looking after us this weekend. <laughs> Truly, we could not have done it without the two of you. This was like it's always an activist nightmare to try and find people who can do good tech stuff. Um, <laughs> so the fact that you guys came in and gave your time all weekend to do that, we are really grateful. And I. Yes, totally. And I guess I just also want the organizing committee members to stand up because I feel like it's really important to acknowledge people who came to organize <laughs> together. Oasis, Prini, Muhammad. Uh, yeah, and I think it's really important to take a look around and say, yeah, we were part of this and we got to, to engage in good dialogue. So thank you very much. Thank you. And Oh, and thank you for coming out. And Giselle, very quickly, I don't want to be disturbing. It's kind of out of the blue and everything. Uh, but I would like our fellow friend and comrade, uh, Roger Landon from OSSDF District, District 12, uh, as a poet and a fellow friend. Uh, Roger, I would like you to read uh, one of the two poems that are on the Q15 uh, on the poetry book, if, if uh, everybody's okay. Absolutely. If not, I think we're going to have to uh, go, but yeah. I totally want you to read that. And uh, just to mention very quickly that February 23rd, we have an, a follow-up meeting to this at John Howard Society saying, what are we going to do now? What are we going to do next for uh, the prisoners' rights, uh, anti-prison industrial complex? Oh, please. And please stay to listen to this poetry. Please stay. Talk a little bit about.